Today on Government Matters, the cyber threat landscape is growing exponentially. Congress created a new position at the White House, the National Cyber Director, to boost America's digital defenses. Today we sit down with Chris Inglis, the first ever National Cyber Director, to talk about his plans to combat ransomware criminals, security breaches, and threats to critical infrastructure. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. With the number of cyber attacks growing, Congress created a new position at the White House, the National Cyber Director. The mission? To strengthen the entire country's cyber defenses. Chris Inglis is the first ever National Cyber Director. Director Inglis, nice to have you. Nice to be with you. How bad is the cyber threat today? You know, leading up to the 9-11 attacks, the intel community was saying the system is blinking red. Is that the case with cyber? I think we're in a difficult place at the moment. We would have what I would describe as a deficit, not simply in the technology, but in the awareness and the skills and the doctrine, who defends what, you know, against what threats. All of that is in the wrong place. That's why we're experiencing in the moment what we would kind of see as a scourge of ransomware, but that's not the only threat that's stalking through cyberspace. That being said, we're also in a good position that we've got the technology, we've got, I think, reasonable doctrine. Our skills are up to the challenge if we apply them in the right way. With regard to critical infrastructure now, this is the electrical grid, the water supply, hospitals. How well are they protected and whose job is it to keep them safe? No, two good questions. I think it's uneven. Um, some sectors, if you look at the financial sector, they're actually doing a really good job. Increasingly, the energy sector, they're also doing a good job. Now, the others are somewhat uneven, um, partially because there was an assumption that they were safe because they used to be physically separated from the internet. That's no longer the case. And partially because there is some confusion about who's accountable, who defends what against what threats. Um, at the end of the day, 85-90% of these critical systems are owned, operated, built, defended in the private sector. The government has a responsibility to assist in their defense, but this has to be a collaboration between both parties. You have suggested that companies should be held liable um, if they fail to implement the appropriate cybersecurity standards and protections for this critical infrastructure. How would that work? Well, I think at some point we're going to get to that place, which is that for these functions that are sufficiently critical that health, safety, lives depend upon them, we're going to have to specify the standards that are not discretionary and then hold various parties accountable. Uh, I myself should be held accountable for some piece of this. That being said, we need to first identify what those critical functions are. We then need to define who it is that delivers those critical functions. Uh, they might be called the entities in government speak. And then we need to make sure we understand what the standards are and those standards need to have both benefits and burdens. The government should assist in defining those standards. The private sector should largely influence and drive those standards. But at the end of the day, someone has to be accountable for it. This is not unlike what we've done in the automobile industry, what we've done in aviation safety, with drug safety. Uh, this is yet another instance where if something is sufficiently critical, we need to take it seriously and do something about it. So this would be like cyber regulations, really? It would be, but not for cyber's sake, for the sake of the critical functions that actually cyber delivers. Um, so cyber is simply a means by which we conduct our personal lives, our business lives, national security matters, and we just need to make sure that it's up to that game. So on the other side, what support does the federal government provide for those private companies that are operating critical infrastructure? Uh, it depends upon the context. If you're a critical infrastructure provider or service provider, um, then you more likely than not have what's called a sector risk management agency, a bit of a government speak term, but essentially for each of those critical sectors, take the energy sector, there's a defined organization within the government that essentially deals with them. Um, hopefully well before a crisis, um, such that we can help them understand how do you actually make a system resilient and robust? What government services can we provide in helping them understand the threat or best practices? What sorts of assistance can we set up ahead of the time so that we have playbooks on the street that we can assist in the time of a contingency or crisis? There are 16 different critical sectors. Um, they probably are not surprising. Um, financial sector, the energy sector, and so on and so forth. And for each of them, there's a government organization that has the responsibility to help them. 
Um, there are also um, organizations that may not be in the critical um, infrastructure, uh, but they conduct things, whether it's personal or business, that are sufficiently important that they should do expect the assistance of government. Um, and so whether it's the Department of Homeland Security and their Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which provides guidance um, for such people and organizations, or the FBI that can help in a time of crisis if you have a crime that's been conducted against you, there's a range of services, and that's just the federal enterprise. State and local increasingly are rising to the challenge as well. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, though, that there is a responsible and a part of the private sector. Individuals, organizations, businesses need to do what they should to defend their cyber assets as much as they defend their physical assets. Um, if you lock your car, you don't leave an iPad on the dash of your car, you don't leave the keys in the ignition because it's convenient, you should figure out what the equivalent of that is in cyberspace. I wonder about intelligence sharing. I mean, would, would the government share that with a private company and say, we're seeing some activity, some possibility of an attack? That has to be a part of it. If the government knows about something that might be coming um, our way, um, it has to determine you know, where that information could be useful, that actionable information, and provide it ahead of time. Not as an historical artifact to say, I can explain what happened to you. Rather, we should be avoiding these perils, and intelligence is an important piece of that. But most of that intelligence, frankly, comes from the private sector. The challenge is, is that no one has all the information necessary to see the entirety of a threat that's running across boundaries, borders that divide us. So collaboration is going to be part of the game. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break right here, and then we'll continue our conversation. Thank you. Coming next to more of my conversation with Chris Inglis about his top priorities in his position as the first ever cyber director. We'll be right back. Out of $2 billion for cybersecurity in the infrastructure bill, $21 million will go toward the Office of the National Cyber Director. Chris Inglis is the first ever National Cyber Director. Chris, I want to talk to you about ransomware attacks. They've been really increasing. Where are the biggest attacks coming from and why the increase? Well, of course, they're coming from cyberspace. That's not a terribly helpful answer. Um, you're probably thinking about a geographic locale. Uh, there are some ungoverned spaces where there is a permissive attitude that allows criminals to flourish. Um, I think we clearly know that some of those are in the near abroad of Russia, but there are also some other quarters that are giving harbor to these ransomware criminals. I think more importantly is to consider what the system is that allows this to occur. Uh, part of that system is that we're not well defended. We haven't made the investments so that we're resilient or robust or have the backups um, or that we have the frontline defenses properly mobilized so that we don't click on the link that we shouldn't click on. Um, that we perhaps don't use two-factor authentication when we're exercising some privileged function inside of our personal or business system. Um, some of this is that the currency that allows criminals to um, secure a ransom, hide that uh, ransom, and then convert that ransom back to hard currency, uh, largely lacks the controls that the typical financial system has. So the cryptocurrency, which has some benefits in other quarters of society, works decidedly against us at this point in time. Some of this is the challenge of actually determining who's who in the zoo, right? You know, who are these people based upon um, the indicators, the sensors that we might deploy? Too often it's very difficult to attribute these in real time, even harder sometimes after um, this kind of trail goes cold. So we have to solve all of those things. Um, the federal government strategy, which is in partnership with the private sector, is to double down on resilience and robustness. Let's make ourselves a harder target. Let's disrupt the current actors. Let's pursue them using all legal means available. Um, we will indict them uh, if necessary. We will arrest them, extradite them, bring them to justice in a court of law. Uh, we need to financially sanction them, freeze their assets, find the currencies um, when we can, return those to the rightful owners, use diplomatic measures to ensure that other like-minded nations are assisting us, um, do all of those things necessary to disrupt. Three, we need to address the illicit uses of cryptocurrency. You would have seen not long ago that the Department of Treasury sanctioned a company um, so somewhere else in the world that was known for having a disproportionate amount of their business um, essentially engaged in helping ransomware criminals convert their ill-gotten gains to hard currency. Um, and then finally, we need to make sure that at the end of the day that this is a private-public collaboration. 
that the government and the private sector each bring their respective strengths and insights to the game so that if you're a criminal in this space, you've got to beat all of us to beat one of us. I want to ask you about reporting, because when there is a ransomware attack, let's say against a private company or organization, what gets reported and to who does it go to? Like, and, and also if there's a, an attack against a government agency, how does that get handled? Well, again, the term of the day might be uneven. Um, it depends. Um, you know, there, there are some regulated components of our um, private sector that will report faithfully kind of all the time because they're expected to and in some cases because they understand that in reporting that they help create a bigger picture that allows us to apply the resources we have in some prioritized fashion in some timely fashion but it is very uneven and, and I think by one estimate that I've seen um, probably less than 20% of these are routinely reported meaning that we're blind about what's happening in the 80% of those um, if the purpose of collecting that information is to mobilize the precious few resources we have in a time of crisis, imagine FEMA not knowing where a hurricane is or not knowing what city is currently under stress. Um, if the purpose is mobilizing the resources, then it's essential that we have a bigger, better, big picture. Um, if the purpose is to figure out what the strategic weaknesses are so that we can make the investments necessary to buy that weakness down and to prevent these, then again, we're not in the right place. There is legislation at the moment, um, several bills that are making their way through the Congress um, that would take this on. And they're working their way through how do you make sure that you define the benefits up front, broadly benefits to the largest possible population, the entirety of kind of the American people and like-minded nations, and, and also be very clear about what the burdens are who has to report what kind of information under what circumstances so that it's the lightest burden possible with the highest benefit possible. And you support that. You support more I of a required report. I do support that. I just think in the absence of information, we're going to be swinging in the dark, and that's not helpful at this moment in time. So a lot of these are coming out of foreign governments. I mean, they, they could, um, you know, these hackers can be on the payroll of a foreign government. How, does, how do we as the U.S. government keep them accountable? How do, you, how do you go after that? I would say when we determine that this either comes from a foreign government or, or I think more insidiously is simply harbored or permitted by a foreign government, um, we use our diplomatic means um, to ensure that we're crystal clear with those governments about what we find acceptable or unacceptable, bring all the pressure that we can to bear, bring in like-minded nations so that we can similarly apply that pressure as well. But at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we apply, in, in some cases, the unilateral measures that we might, where you indict, um, hopefully um, cause some country to um, find these people, arrest these people, extradite these people. They will travel, or perhaps uh, their decision calculus is altered by the fact that they possibly can never travel again. Um, anyway, bring all the pressure to bear that we can um, to ensure that we don't simply tolerate, sit back, and allow this permissive um, danger to rise. All right, another little quick break here, and then we'll continue our conversation. Thank you. Coming next, we wrap up our conversation about the growing cybersecurity threat landscape and recommendations from where to go from here. We'll be right back. The government has other established agencies to confront cyber threats, but the National Cyber Director is a new position at the White House. Chris Inglis is the first ever National Cyber Director. Chris, I want to ask you about your role. You're the first ever um, Cyber Director at the White House. How do you see that role and what do you want to accomplish? Well, Mimi, as you indicate, it's a crowded space. There are already quite a few cyber roles in the federal um, infrastructure uh, and also within the private uh, sector as well. So, so it's not that this is new or that it, this is filling a vacuum. Uh, the role, therefore, must be to add value to what's already there. Um, the premise of the National Cyber Director is to not then assume control in a hierarchical fashion of all those assets, but rather to bring context and leverage and coherence to them 
um, so that as they do their concurrent responsibilities, they complement one another, that there's no competition, there's no underlap within the federal government, and if you're outside looking at the federal government, you don't need a PhD in government to figure out how to deal with us, that we provide proactive, coherent, focused services and support um, in a way that makes sense. Um, so that's the job. What actual authority do you have? Um, broadly, the statute is quite clear that I have authority to assess performance, I have authority and accountability, I think more importantly, um, to drive federal coherence in various ways, how we build it, how we defend it, how we provide services to the critical infrastructure in the private sector. Um, I have authority to ensure that we're driving public-private collaboration in the right direction. That's different than a division of effort. It's a fundamentally new concept. Um, information itself does not collaborate, people do, and so how do you actually create those relationships? And then attended to that, there are a number of things that we should do to simply create the playbooks, to exercise those playbooks, to create the muscle memory. All of that is within the remit of the National Cyber Director. And do you advise the President directly? I do. I'm not the only one who advises the President on matters of national security that have an implication in cyberspace, but I do. It's an important part of the role. How large is the office? Uh, the office ultimately will grow to probably something in the order of 75, 80 people when you consider the lines of effort that we have. At the moment, we've just crossed double digits. Um, we are an authorized but not yet appropriated entity. We're waiting for our initial funding to come in fiscal year 22. I'm confident that it will. Um, we have, I think, our ideas are well-formed, well-shaped, and we've developed the relationships of the organizations that we will work with and through. Uh, most recently, we just, just designated the Federal Chief Information Security Officer as the Deputy National Cyber Director for Federal Cybersecurity. That's reflective of the kind of relationships that we will build out. How do you convince federal agencies then to prioritize cybersecurity in their budgets, which is really where it counts? That's a good question. Uh, first and foremost, you need to define cyber not for its own sake, but as an enabler of something else. You know, what are the missions that these organizations undertake? What are the purposes for which they build digital infrastructure, the internet, and use it? They need to understand that so that this is not perceived as a cost center or somebody else's problem or simply a commodity that you can just get right by buying it and kind of stuffing it into a corner. Ultimately, that accountability comes to agency heads, department heads. That's the first part of it. Once they understand that and they understand that this enables, this drives their business to be more successful, I think you can then kind of follow through with the rest of what they have to do to get that done. There's a fellow named Jeff Moss who kind of is behind kind of those conventions like Black Hat and DEF CON. He had the most wonderful quote for me a couple of weeks ago. He said, do you know why race cars have bigger brakes? I said, I'm not entirely certain. He goes, so they can go faster. I think we need to think of cyber the same way. Cyber actually, its purpose is to help our missions go faster or bigger or bolder. And we need to think that way um, up front. Do you think agencies are moving quickly enough? I think they're moving quickly. I don't think it's quickly enough. I just think that we have a deficit, not just in the technology, but a deficit in how we've thought about this, in the skills of our people, in the doctrine about how we actually collaborate to defend this space, um, that will take some time to fix. Years in the making, um, we're not going to fix this in a fortnight, but we're moving with speed in the right direction. You use the term federal coherence as a goal. Explain that a little bit more. What does that really mean? Um, just take the civilian side of the federal government. There are 102 agencies and departments. If every one of them built their own digital infrastructure, their own kind of component of the internet, and defended it according to their own standards, um, and operated independent of one another, um, you'd have 102 organizations that had to get it exactly right without any leverage or dependence on the party to the left of them, the party to the right of them. Um, that would be grossly incoherent. We need to have unity of effort, unity of purpose, unity of messaging, but we need to make it such that, again, you've got to beat all of us to beat one of us. Um, and today, we really don't have that infrastructure built such that it is a single enterprise. There will be distinguished purposes that perhaps kind of take into one corner or another something for an agency or department that nobody else has, but the foundations need to be in common. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, $2 billion is set aside for cybersecurity in the infrastructure bill. $21 million goes to your office. How is that money going to be spent? Um, quite a lot of that is salaries. Um, to some degree, we then have to pay our bills in terms of the facilities that we would occupy, um, some small amount of travel. But, but most of that is for salaries. If you kind of figure out the number of people we're going to have, figure out what your nominal government salary is, you pretty quickly get up to that figure um, in a short period of time. You were confirmed by the Senate in June. 
How has the job been so far? Well, I've been on the, do on the job for about 100 days. Uh, I would say it's been good. Um, despite the fact that we've not had an appropriation yet, it's given us an opportunity to work through what are the big ideas that would add value to the parts that are already in this space. Uh, we've had an opportunity to work with and through organizations to define, develop those relationships. And at every turn, we've been met with a very positive response. And so I would say, so far, so good. If you were to talk directly to people within the government, affiliated with the government, about cybersecurity, what's your most important message that you want to say? And say that this is all of our responsibilities. You know, I'm often asked what makes you lie awake at night. There might be a number of things, but the one that in this camp I would say comes first and foremost to mind is complacency. Um, the idea that while this is a problem, that it's probably a problem for somebody else, it's our problem. Every one of us, every organization, every sector, every government has a responsibility to do something. And if we do that in a collaborative, integrated fashion, respecting privacy and proprietary interest, um, we'll make the proposition such that if you're a transgressor in this space, you've got to beat all of us to beat one of us. That would be a new and novel idea. And it affects all of us, obviously. All of us. All of us. Chris, thanks so much for being on the program. So nice talking to you. Thank you, Mimi. If you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's on our website, govmatters.tv. And listen to our Government Matters podcast, available on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. You can also find every episode on our website. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 10.30 on WJLA 24-7 News and Sunday mornings at 10.30 on 7 News to stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.